So it's live. Should turn that off. Good evening. Hi, Molly. How are you doing? I'm fine, thanks. How are you? Good, thank you. Just printed off the agenda, so I'll let... Oh. <laughs> There's that. So you're hoping it will just last an hour. Good luck with that. <laughs> we hope so. <laughs> Right, you're unmuted now. Hi. Hello. No hide. One second. Um, view, gallery view. Just trying to set up the Facebook Live because this view is, is, has been delayed in the court case, so he's asking me to host and I haven't done this before. <laughs> <laughs> Big learning curve then. We've been doing this for about <laughs> eight months and it feels like familiar territory. <laughs> so you're going to let people in at about six o'clock. Is that how it works or are you ready? So we've got about half the people who've joined already, I think, so we'll just give a few more minutes. 
Maureen, I think you're muted. As you said, how many are you expecting? Uh, 30 plus, plus have registered. Lovely. 33 that have registered. Yeah. It's such a pity that we can't actually be in Scotland. It is. We've, I'd really hoped to have it at the Parliament. I'd been in discussion with people and yeah. we've kind of got it more or less set up and then, <laughs> and then what happened. Um, yeah. so, you know. The only nice thing about this Zoom is that you can record this and you can send it to all those that you really would like to yes. um, see, the, you know, see the launch of the report in Scotland. So. It's got its little bit of advantages. I think people can be a little bit zoomed out, but then they can watch this at their leisure, which is lovely. And the fact that people registered has been really amazing for me to think that, you know, everybody, hopefully most of them are from Scotland. I think so. Someone's just mentioned that they're deaf. Um, I, I don't know, sometimes Zoom can do amazing things like do subtitles for you but I don't know if this webinar has that feature the host uh, might be able to see I don't know myself I can deep hi, hi. hi morning hi Trishna hello. hello does anybody know how or if we can get captions or subtitles on zoom Um, I'm quite a fast typer. I could try to type in the chat for the person um, the basics of what's been said, if that's helpful. Um, any answer to this question? Well, I'm getting expert advice from my daughter. <laughs> Live. No? No. Um, do you want me to, to say to the person, I can't do it when I'm doing my own short speech? Uh, well, with my uh, presentation, it's going to be actually a presentation with slides. Lovely. So that will be visible. Mm -hmm. um, Do you want me to see that talks. to... Type that into there so she... Yeah, yeah Manjeet, yeah. so yes. shall we... Yes, shall please, we... if you could. Yeah, I can tell her. I'll say, um, hi, Manjeet. Um, is it the first presentation? Uh, yes, the main one would be... Uh, which is the main the one, yeah. yeah. Which is the main one will have slides with written information. Hope this is helpful. Um, do you want me to say I can type type in the chat some of the main points coming from the other speakers? Yes, please. If you're okay. willing to yeah, do I'm that, yeah, I'm happy to do that. Yeah, that would be very much appreciated. That should be helpful, Morning. Thanks so much. So it's two minutes past. Shall we start? We'll give another couple of minutes. It's 25 people have said logged on. So. Yeah. so let's start. Yeah. So let me start with the Wai Guruji Ka Khalsa, Wai Guruji Ki Fateh. Um, welcome to the Scottish launch of the British Sikh Report. Um, this is the first time that we've been able to organise a launch event specifically for Scotland. Um, I have visited there and gone round to some organisations and to um, I think met Trishna as well once and handed copies of the report, but not actually had a launch event in Scotland. So thank you to all the Scottish friends and colleagues who are virtually hosting us uh, up there and participating in this event. We'd also like to say a huge thank you to the organisation that are supporting this year's BSR, which are the National Health Service, NHS, City Seeks, and the Sikh Assembly. Um, after presenting the main results of the survey, I will introduce our esteemed speakers from Scotland to share their views on the report and its findings. Uh, this is the eighth BSR, having started in 2013. We normally launch the report in April or May of each year, but because of the pandemic, everything's been delayed this year. We, we had hoped that by now it would be possible to hold launches in various parts of the country. However, in the spirit of Jardi Kala, all virtual events in London, Wales, Midlands and North of England have been quite successful. 
and we're completing our sort of northbound journey here in Scotland. In the face of so much sort of fake news and alternative facts, it is extremely important to have sound and solid facts and cystics to support the arguments. Um, used properly, cystics can be a great force for good, but if misused, you get reminded of that saying, lies, damned lies and cystics. And me being a statistician, you know, we, we hate that sort of saying. Cystics need to be produced to high standards and independently of political influence so that they can inform decision making, support the monitoring and progress and change. Now, the aim of VSR is to provide high quality, reliable cystics independently available to, for anyone to use about Sikhs in Britain. Cystics about the Sikh population, their views on various topics and issues of the day. Now, I'm just going to start sharing my screen. With my, the presentation of the results of the VSR. And I want to start off by firstly saying that in order to maintain quality, we do our very best to make sure that we apply the same principle that are used in producing official cystics. Um, my background is I was a deputy director in the Office for National Cystics, and I'm still involved with the Royal Cystical Society um, and on the National Cystics Advisory Group for the UK. Um, and so I've tried to apply the principles of the UK Cystics Authority's Code of Practice, which provides excellent advice that we aim to follow. Um, there are three main pillars to the Code of Practice, which are trustworthiness, quality and value. Um, the Code attaches great importance to the needs of users of cystics. Um, so they have to be of value to the users, not just cystics produced for the sake of cystics. And when we say high quality cystics, we mean that they must be accurate, but also relevant to users' needs, timely and accessible. So we'll move on now to uh, some of the detail of the uh, report. Now, the report is largely based on a survey that we carry out, uh, largely online through social media, email lists and websites, through Sikh and Punjabi organisations, Gurdwaras and community groups. The data for this year's report was collected between December 19 and March 20, so it's mostly before the epidemic uh, lockdown and so on. Um, and normally, as I said, we publish in April or May, very timely, but this year, because of the pandemic, the, uh, the report has been delayed. We monitor the responses by age, gender, marital status and region to make sure that uh, the sample is representative. There's often a shortfall in the elderly through the online surveys. So we address that by um, using paper forms that people fill in either at day centers for the elderly or in Gurdwaras. Um, we quality assure all the responses, every single response is looked at and we do have to reject some because of inconsistencies internally. And the resulting sample this year is of 2,700 robust and reliable uh, sort of responses which produce quite good results. The sample, we have to say, is not large enough to produce uh, good quality statistics for individual re English regions or the devolved nations. Um, really is good enough for either the whole of the UK or groups of regions. And I have to say also that we are very, very grateful to all the volunteers um, who helped to put the report together. They're all listed on page 53 of the report, and it's all done in the spirit of SEWA. So uh, everything is done uh, in terms of uh, voluntarily contributing your time and effort. Uh, the topics covered in this year's uh, survey uh, include organ donation, voting in the general election in December 19, because we were just about to start uh, collecting the data when the election was on, so we thought it was very timely. Uh, we've asked about accommodation, uh, ownership of uh, the property that people live in. We've asked about crime and fear of crime, about marriages and weddings, um, teaching of relationships and sex education in schools, about Sikh faith schools, about disability, loneliness, people's connections with Punjab and India, their views on the issues related to drug abuse in India and about the arts. We also have data on identity, ethnicity, uh, observance of the five Ks and whether people are wearing the star or turban and whether they're amritari or not. 
and that's uh, information we've been collecting for three years. And also, uh, right throughout the history of the report, we've been uh, collecting demographic information on age, gender, marital status, and, and so on. And that helps us to break down the, the other information we collect on each of the topics. So moving on to some of the highlights of the report. Um, firstly, uh, being a, a survey of Sikhs, we asked whether uh, are you a practicing Amritari? And 11% of the old respondents said that they are Amritari, but it varied quite a bit by age. So 25% of the over 65s uh, said that they're Amritari, whereas it's much lower in um, the, the younger age groups. And we can use this variable to break down uh, and analyze answers to other questions as to whether the views of Amritari Sikhs were different from non Amritaris. Turning to the general election, um, now looking at the top chart, 78% of the Sikh respondents said that they did vote, 9% didn't vote, and 13% said that they didn't want to say how or whether they voted. So that means that at least 70% voted and possibly some of the 13% as well. So it's, that's quite a good turnout. Um, looking at the lower chart, uh, that uh, relates to the whole population of the UK through uh, a YouGov survey. Now, the, in the top chart, on the left, you see uh, red bars uh, by age group. Each bar represents a different age group with the youngest at the top. And on the right hand of the bars, the blue color is conservatives, left to red is the Labour. And what we found among Sikh voters was 45% said they voted Labour, 22% conservative, 6% Lib Dems and 3% Greens. But it differs greatly by age, uh, so that uh, there are a much higher percentage of Labour voters in the younger age groups, and it reduces with age, and the conservative share increases by age. And what's very interesting is that that pattern is very similar to the total population, although it's at a different level. Uh, so you see from the lower chart, it's a very similar pattern there. Um, we also asked, uh, analyzed the data by gender and 14% of Sikh women and 31% of men voted conservative. So there's quite a big difference between men and women. Um, and uh, 50% of Sikh women and 39% of men voted Labour. Now, again, the levels are different, but the actual difference is in the same direction as the total population. Now, this uh, particular chart is a big health warning. It's not in the report. It's just a little bit of analysis I did just for this uh, event. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the sample is too small to produce accurate results for any region. But I just thought I would still give it a go. The small sample that we have got, what does it show in terms of the SNP, uh, for example, um, because that, it doesn't show up very much in the national UK wide results. And what it shows is actually that of that small sample with a big confidence interval, so I keep we have noting the health warnings, uh, but actually 40% said that they voted SNP, 24% Labour. 14% Conservative and same 14% for Lib Dems and 3% for the Brexit party. Um, so that uh, I think is quite interesting result, but again, health warning, uh, it's a small sample. The confidence intervals, they do mean that that 40% of SNP could be anything from 28, 29% up to 52% and likewise with the others. But I think that generally uh, the trend is probably not far off the mark. Turning to accommodation um, and ownership status, 45% uh, of respondents said that they live in properties that they wholly own, and plus 29% were buying with a mortgage. Only 11% live in rented accommodation, and of those, 8% in private rented accommodation, 2% in council housing, and 1% in housing associations. The 9% live rent-free, and they're most likely to be the younger people living with their parents. Turning to crime and fear of crime, um, the majority uh, who responded to the question, have you or your family ever directly experienced any hate crimes in the UK? The majority said that they hadn't. Uh, and we asked this question of whether uh, incidents were before 2016 or after, 
so before or after the Brexit vote, because there was a shift at that time. Um, now, those who say that they have experienced hate crimes uh, reduces by age, so there's a higher percentage of younger victims. On the other hand, the fear of crime, whether people are worried about uh, being attacked because of their race, ethnicity, or religion, um, that uh, rises actually, so that uh, the lowest figure is for the young and the highest is for the elderly, with 19% of those aged 65 and over, um, <coughs> really worried about uh, their fear of crime and being attacked. We then turn to marriages, um, ask people whether they're married, and two thirds of British Sikh adults are married, compared with about half of UK as a whole. And the married rate increases by age, with 35% for 20 to 34 year olds, rising to 90% for the 65 plus age group. We, we asked how people met their partner or spouse, and 44% said that they had arranged marriages. Uh, but that varies hugely by age. So 13% of the 20 to 34 year olds uh, said that they had an arranged or assisted marriage, while 80% of the 65 plus age group. And for love marriages, uh, in quotes, uh, it's the other way around. That is the highest in younger age groups and it declines gradually uh, as with the older age groups. Amr Thari Sikhs are much more likely to have arranged marriages, 63% compared with 44% for Sikhs as a whole. We asked people how much their wedding actually cost as a whole. And the top chart breaks this down by different age groups. So the first set of bars is 20 to 34 year olds. The next lot is 35 to 49, then 50 to 64 and 65 and over. And clearly the costs are going to vary because the oldest age group may have got married uh, many, many years ago, it could be 30, 40 years ago. And also not necessarily in this country, it could have been in India or another country before they came to the UK. So there is large variation, but of the 65 and over group, two thirds of them said that their weddings cost under 10,000 pounds and nearly all of them were under 30,000 pounds. At the other extreme with the youngest group, 20 to 34 year olds, they range from under 10,000 pounds to over 100,000 pounds. So we, we then asked, what was the most expensive part of your wedding? And receptions are now the most expensive item. Historically, it was the Anand Karaj and lunch and breakfast at the Gurdwara, but now that has shifted. Um, for some, the honeymoon was the most expensive part, uh, and for others, it was actually dowry or large. Um, Again, looking at it by whether people are Amartari or not, Amartari spent much less uh, and with 50% of the weddings having cost less than £10,000. Turning to the teaching of relationships and sex education in schools, uh, we asked whether uh, should schools teach about family types and we asked about various different family types and we've got two examples on uh, this slide. Uh, the single parent families at the top and same sex parent families at the uh, at bottom. And generally, the majority do support uh, teaching in schools. 90% of younger groups and two thirds of the oldest age groups with the first category of single parent family. So it, the support declines by age. There's also lower support from males compared with females and lower support from Amartari Sikhs. And the pattern is similar for different types of families, uh, although it's at different levels. So with the same sex parent families, the, the bars on the left where it says yes, there's lower support, but the trend is similar in terms of by age, it reduces as you get older. There have been protests in outside some schools in the Midlands um, about the, this teaching. And so we asked people what their views are about the protests outside schools. And the majority don't agree, and there's more agree, uh, but there's more agreement from men than from women. Uh, so that's what these two charts show, and all of these charts are in the report, by the way. So I'm just speeding through these because we have a lot to get through. Um, we asked people's views about Sikh faith schools. Is there a Sikh faith school in your area? And 52% uh, of British Sikhs said they do have a Sikh faith school in their area. Uh, and 64% of Amritharis. Now, this is possibly a reflection of the fact that uh, around half, you know, 50 odd percent of Sikhs live in 
uh, a few large concentrations, whether it's in the Midlands, uh, the different parts of London, Slough to the west of London and so on. And in those areas, you have got Sikh schools, uh, but of the rest, they're quite spread out across the rest of the country. Um, so whilst uh, there is a, a reasonable percentage that are near to schools, there are many that are not. So then we asked, do you think that there should be a Sikh faith school in your area? And there, about 54% would like a Sikh uh, faith school in their area. And there's higher support from males and from Amartaris. Uh, with Amartaris, there's 72% saying that there, there should be a Sikh faith school in their area. Um, just looking at regional breakdown. So in the Midlands, 67% uh, of respondents said that they live near a Sikh school and 57% in Greater Southeast, but uh, very little outside that. Um, we asked about people's reasons for choice of school for their children. And by far the most important reason they gave was educational achievement at 75%. Then second was uh, location and proximity and thirdly facilities at the school. Um, faith ethos actually came in at number seven so it's not considered enough on its own. So whilst there's very high support from the earlier slide that you saw for faith schools, it's not enough just for that. They must also be accompanied by very high quality education. Turning to disability, we asked people uh, who said that they were disabled about the type of disability. And half of those uh, said that they have a physical impairment, 18% had mental health, uh, uh, but we also had different percentages in various other categories, for example, learning disability, autism, visual impairment, hearing impairment, communication, and also complex health needs, which is actually 7%. Um, we have disabled in all age groups, but the highest is in the 65 plus age group at 17%. We asked uh, those who are disabled whether they have assistance from social services or how they're helped, do you receive any assistance? And that half of them, well, over 50% said that they're looked after by family. A quarter have some assistance either from social services or carers through community or voluntary organizations um, or actually privately organized carers. And only 19% have any arrangements for respite care. Loneliness, we asked about how often do you feel that lack of companionship? And there, uh, what was interesting was that the young feel most lack of companionship, um, but also as we would expect, I think that those in relationships uh, are the least lonely. So those who are married and civil partnered, uh, which is in the lower chart, uh, whereas those who are divorced and separated that they're um, feeling uh, the lack of companionship more. We asked about issues of concern in Punjab. Uh, which issues in the Punjab are of most concern to you? And the two highest were drugs and alcohol and corruption, but also uh, fairly high of issues of concern were environment and uh, human rights. Now this um, survey was done right at the beginning of the year it was before some other issues that have arisen during this year, such as the Kisan or farmers issue. So that's not covered in this survey, but I think if, if we were doing the survey now, that would come out as fairly high as well. We then asked people about arts and what sort of arts they have an interest in. And the highest uh, interest was in film and cinema, but the second highest was Sikh religious paintings and art. Uh, but there are lots of other categories uh, with uh, decreasing levels of support. And you can see this chart and some discussion in the report. Uh, finally, just want to turn to the subject of organ donation. Um, at the beginning of the report, we have an article on organ donation written by Dr. Jagbir Jyoti Jihal from Birmingham University. Um, it's related to views around the change in the law this year where um, there's been a switch to an opt-out system uh, rather than previously where you had to opt in by registering and or carrying a donor card and so on. Um, so we asked whether people knew about the law that was coming in earlier this year. 
51% said that they were aware of the law change. And there's the highest awareness was among 50 to 64 year olds. Um, and awareness decreases with younger age groups. Um, there's also higher awareness among females at 54% compared with males at 49, but not a huge difference. We asked whether people are happy to be assumed to be donors uh, as, as default with the opt-out system. And 62% said that they are so, 17% uh, said not, and there's almost virtually the same level of support from both males and females. We also asked whether people consider organ donation to be a form of seva or service uh, to the wider community after passing away. And two thirds said that they do uh, consider organ donation to be a form of seva. And that was similar both for males and for females. Now, one issue around this opt-out law is that your family members could still actually uh, object to uh, your organs being taken for transplant. So it's very important that people uh, discuss their wishes with their family. And so we asked whether you have discussed your wishes regarding organ donation with your family. And one third or 34% said that they have discussed uh, their wishes with the family. This rises with age. So 40% of those aged 65 and over have done so. Um, and 38% of females have discussed their wishes compared with 30% of males. So more women than men. So that was my quick run through the report. Um, let me just stop the share and get everybody back on screen. Um, I hope that was all clear. And um, Jasweer has joined us now. So Jasweer, can I hand the chair chairing back to you? Uh, yes. Thank you, Jigdev, and thank you for uh, stepping in to uh, to chair uh, as well as you did. And thanks also for sharing the information, the data that's contained within the British Seek report, which is always such a fascinating part of the uh, British SEEK report project. The fact that this data is created by SEEKs, for SEEKs, but also for the wider community. I think that's a very important point for us to bear in mind and remember. Uh, just one, a few points in respect of the organ donation aspect. The organ donation question about the change of law was in respect to the change of law in England and Wales. In Scotland, I understand that the law is going to change on the 26th of March next year, 2021. But the conversations that have taken place in respect of having those discussions with family members, making sure that they understand what your wishes are, are really important. There's a lot of work that's gone into uh, organ donation awareness within certainly England, uh, within, the, within the Sikh community. Uh, with a number of projects which are referred to within the article by Dr. Jagbej Jati Johal. Uh, it's certainly worth reading through carefully just to see what exactly has happened in England, but then also to see what you may wish to want to do in Scotland over the next few months to ensure that people are aware of what those changes will be and what they will entail. I'm now going to um, ask Trishna Singh to say a few words. Krishna is the founder and director of Sikhs and Job, which is the only Sikh family support charity in Scotland. Um, she's always a wonderful speaker, so I'm going to hand over to her now, Krishna. Thank you, um, Jasweer. Um, good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I'm really pleased to see that there's so many of you from Scotland that have joined um, this event. It's been um, a, a long time coming. We had actually hoped for it to be launched at the Scottish Parliament in September, but then everything changed. And so we're now very much aware of the fact that Zoom has become the launch, new launch pad for everything. Um, I've, I've read through the report and a lot of it's been covered. What I was going to see is a lot been already been covered. So I don't really want to repeat everything, but I did think that the the article by Dr. Jagbir Jagdi Joel bringing you know, home the reality of the needs for Sikhs to really consider um, organ donation. I thought that was, it's really um, made me think that it's not something that we talk about and we really don't want to discuss it. Everybody finds it really difficult. So reading through the report and seeing how much work has been done in England around this, going around the Gurdwaras and everything, I think that's something that, although that I know that there has been some work done in Scotland, but not to the extent that has been done in England. And I just feel that's something that you know, we need to really look at and get in touch with the Gurdwaras to help us to push this forward. I mean, everybody has their own views on it, but 
And I think reading about it in the report to see where people were saying that they saw it as a saver, as something, and, I, and I've never really considered it in that way. I've never thought about it like that. And so I, th I thought that was really eye-opening for me um, and reading it and thinking that, well, this is something that has been around. People talk about it in different ways, but I've never looked at it as saver. So for me, um, I think that's something that I would be, you know, kind of speaking to people about um, when if we take this forward. Um, it's, um, Sikhs, well, Sikhs and yoga, as we just said, is the only Sikh family support and charity in Scotland. And over the years, we have engaged with the Scottish government at many levels, kind of emphasising the need for statistics and data on the Sikh community in Scotland. And I know the British Sikh report kind of covers the UK, but we can also see from the findings that input from Scotland is very minimal. And equally, there's areas that are different from England um, in Scotland as a developed nation, I see that, you know, I can look at education, for example. And for me, that's a huge, there's a huge difference in what happens in England in comparison to Scotland. And even the fact about the faith schools. So there are 15, but they're all in England. And I don't think anybody in Scotland has ever even kind of discussed that issue or looked at it in some way in a serious way to see that is this something that we in Scotland the Sikhs that live in Scotland would consider or think about, or has there been any discussion around it? I know we run the local community Punjabi classes in most of the Gurdwaras, but again, in some, it's kind of very kind of grassroots and it's not reached the area where people can actually sit their exams in this. So there's, you know, the, the education in Scotland is different. And the other area, which I'm just, I'm not going to go into, but is health. And that's another area in Scotland that differs in the way that services are delivered in Scotland and how we kind of see them and how, and actually there's not been that much in-depth research done into how many Sikh families are actually the main carers for people with disabilities or the elderly. And there is still this huge assumption around about caring for the elderly and the, you know, the extended family. That is such very much alive within the mainstream population of service providers that this still happens within the Sikh and other Asian communities, but mainly the Sikh community. And actually that's not the case so much. And that's something that needs to be addressed because we don't talk about it and people are still making those assumptions. But the, the, the report really does highlight, um, it gives us a real insight into things right across the UK. And I believe that it, it provides an excellent platform for us in Scotland um, to build on. And for me, I think it would really, I would really welcome the opportunity to work alongside the city seats to help to develop and you know, bring a more in-depth Scottish seat report. And I think that would, you know, I, although the British seat report would be there for reference and everything, but there does need to be, I think we need to all acknowledge the fact that the lifestyles of Sikhs living in England to the lifestyles of Sikhs living in Scotland varies hugely. There are areas around the religious aspect that are similar and, and that these are things that can be worked on, but actually in general of the deity to lifestyles and the attitudes and what people think about these issues is very different. So I'm just going to stop there, but I'd just like to say thank you to everybody. Thank you. Krishna, thank you so much. And uh, thank you for the uh, call to action effectively, asking us to think about developing a uh, Scottish seat report. Uh, in the very least, what the British Seat Report can do is make sure that we focus more on the issues affecting the Scottish Seat community. And I think that's an important um, consideration for us to take. So, Trishna, thank you so much for that. I'm now going to uh, ask Dr. Maureen Sia to uh, say a few words. Uh, Dr. Sia is the Director of Interfaith Scotland, uh, and she has also been helpfully typing away and summarising the uh, event this evening. Thank you so much, Maureen, over to you. Thank you, thank you very much, Jess Beer. Um, as Director of Interfaith Scotland, a national um, organisation that supports faith communities in Scotland, I'm always deeply interested in how religious communities live, live their religion and what difference does it make to their lives and to the lives of those around them. And so I thank you for this really informative report and for the opportunity to speak tonight. Um, this report highlighted to me just how central faith is to the life of Sikhs, um, particularly in three areas that I'm just going to touch on. I mean, so much has been spoken about uh, another area. So working in interfaith, I think I'm the person to talk about faith. <laughs> 
So the three areas I'm going to look at are spirituality, um, service, and culture. So in the report, it stated that 84% of Sikhs recite prayers and scripture either daily or with frequency. So this is a really powerful indication to me of a personal commitment to faith. Only 16% never practice this part of Sikh spirituality. So I think that's very notice, you know, a very noticeable thing. And the Sikh teachings place a great emphasis on self, selfless service, seva, and altruism. And so that Sikhs engage in three forms of selfless service. This is rendered through one's body, through one's mind, and through giving of one's material wealth. While all three forms of service or serva are considered equally important, the Sikh Guru stressed that all should be a labour of love. This was mentioned in the report. And I just wanted to say how beautiful that is, that your service is seen as a labour of love. Now, recently in Scotland, this selfless service was demonstrated by the Sikh community during this COVID pandemic, when literally thousands of meals were prepared and delivered by the Sikh community to the most vulnerable and isolated in our society. So a huge thank you for that. And I think the report reflects your attitude of service and I've seen it in action. So I know there's huge accuracy there. But the report also demonstrated the types of jobs that Sikhs choose to do. The top sector of employment being healthcare, education and teaching, public service, charity and social work. And I find that really interesting because all those jobs have at their very heart service to others. So even in the kind of jobs that Sikhs are choosing to do, their faith is having, I think, a huge influence. And that, again, was really interesting to me. So then there's the area of culture. Um, and so I'm going to look at a few things, things like family, the arts, global connections and how all of that impacts on culture. So I found it really interesting as a, as a Scot that 20% of Sikhs live in multi-generational settings. Um, you know, that could be either three or four generations living together. And I think that's slightly different to just the general Scottish population, which is generally just two, gen, you know, two generational. So that's one in four Sikhs living in multi-generational settings. Very interesting. And again, probably an aspect of your religion and culture. Connection with the Punjab, over 60% visit regularly for weddings and funerals and family gatherings. Again, this huge link and commitment to family, but that's very closely followed by pilgrimage. Again, another huge demonstration of how important the Sikh faith is to the majority of Sikhs. I mean, 60% is still the majority of Sikhs, so you know, that's a lot of people going on pilgrimage. And the arts, now the most popular category of interest was film and cinema, but that I think is just, that's us, isn't it? And us Brits, really. We do love our films and we do love our TV and we do love our cinema, whether we're Sikhs, Muslims, Hindus, <laughs> Christians or otherwise. So that didn't surprise me. But then that's closely followed again by this emphasis on the Sikh religion by Sikh religious paintings and art, folk music, such as the Bhangra and Geet, architecture, traditional Punjabi folk dance, all of that together makes up the next most en enjoyed category of culture by the Sikh community. So this report actually get a really interesting insight to me on just how central to Sikh identity religion is. And so I think it's really important. So this report was clear evidence to me of the deeply spiritual nature of the Sikh community, of how much they do to be of service to the UK and indeed Scottish society. And it is that their faith motivates them to do this, to be of service. It isn't just a coincidence that Sikhs are of service to the community that's embedded in their scripture and in their way of life. And also how successfully they live in a bicultural milieu, you know, that they can flip between England, Scot you know, England, Scotland and the Punjab and back again. And so they're living in this dual identity. They have this biculturalism, um, which I think is really interesting, with, you know, with 60 percent visiting India, India regularly. 
and also how much seat culture and just imbues your lives with one in four living, as I mentioned, in multi-generational families and 70% seriously enjoying aspects of their distinctly Sikh culture, such as Sikh dance, Sikh music, Sikh art and Sikh architecture. Um, I mean, this is this is a bit like Canadians and Americans and Brit, you know, Scots that go to Canada, New Zealand, um, America, who dearly love their Scottish culture and heritage. Um, and it's such a deeply human thing to do. You know, you go to Canada and all the Scots there are wearing kilts and doing the Highland fling, whereas in Scotland, I mean, we do do it, but it, you know, it's really embedded in Scottish culture when they live around the globe. And I think that's just the same with the Sikh community and it's what you'd expect. And I think it's a really healthy thing. So um, it's deeply human and it brings rich diversity to our nation. I actually think all of this Sikh heritage and culture and service and spirituality is a huge and positive plus to our nation. But dis and so despite all of the above, I'm going to end on a note that deeply and, and really sincerely troubles me. And that is that in the Sikh community across all age groups together, almost 40% of Sikhs stated they were very worried or worried about attacks because of the color of their skin. Now this speaks volumes to me and states quite clearly that racism is still alive and kicking in the United Kingdom and that this beautiful spiritual community who live lives of service to all of us, who bring lively and beautiful cultural diversity to our country, live in fear of attack because of the colour of their skin. So all of us working in a field that celebrates religious and cultural diversity and recognises the great contribution that such diversity brings to our land needs to work even harder to get our message out there. We live in a multi-faith, multicultural Britain and we welcome this, indeed we love it, and we will work and work and work until hate, discrimination and prejudice no longer lives here. Thank you for this report and for the opportunity to speak tonight. Maureen, thank you so much. Uh, and thank you for tying back the British Sikh report to the concept of service or seva in such a, uh, a thoughtful and considered way. You're absolutely right. So many of us who are Sikh do go into professions that are about caring for others or looking for others and serving others because that's our faith. So thank you, Maureen. And I think also on the point you've raised about hate crimes, uh, I'm sure many of us will be aware of the appalling images we've seen on social media of the schoolboy in Telford who was subjected to uh, abuse simply because of the fact that he was wearing a turban or he had a top knot. And I think it's very mindful of us. We are very reminded of just how at risk we are as Sikhs of hate crimes. Uh, I'm now going to invite Martin Doherty MP to say a, a few words. He is uh, the MP for Western Barsonshire, and he is a representative on behalf of the Scottish Nationalist Party. Martin. Well, uh, thank you, Chairman. First of all, I, I hope you can hear me. And if you can just let me know that, that would be very much appreciated. We can hear you. Thanks. Yeah, uh, thank you. Just maybe a slight correction. It's the Scottish National Party. Um, first of all, Thank you for the kind invite to uh, address you this evening, if not so briefly, from um, a chair on a, a train speeding from London, Euston, back across the border to Glasgow Central, uh, and to speak briefly on the report. I think, as some of the chat has alluded to, that um, there, due to the, the the way in which it's collect, collated, like a lot, like a lot of uh, research, the, there is kind of limited um, information relationship either both to Scotland. To Wales, uh, that we should all be consider I can also say if at any point Tom Gill's a member of the House of Commons, uh, I hope as members of the Spire Seek community are aware of, and that's the case of Jagta Singh Johar. Oh, Martin, unfortunately, we seem to be cutting in and out of reception uh, for yourself. It was my constituent, a young Scot, 
sorry about that. If, if I do, please do just cut me off and go to the next speaker. I'm afraid it's the, the joys of traveling. Um, so I know that the issue does create some um, consternation within the community, but I think there's a wider understanding and acceptance that what I am trying to achieve and, and what his family is trying to achieve is India, not just for him, but for any UK national who should find themselves in a similar position. Uh, I've also been participating uh, as a member of the uh, uh, all-party parliamentary group on Sikhs in Britain uh, on a whole range of other issues. Only recently made a lobby on the Indian government's legislation on farmers in the Punjab. And I have to say that the vice chair of the all-party parliamentary group is actually sitting across from me in another section of the train, Alison Fulis, who's the member for Glasgow Central. She speaks home as well. Just me, briefly, as I may, and, and on a point of reflection, uh, from a, a previous um, speaker was the diversity of the Sikh Scottish community and, I, and, I, and uh, I come from a, an Irish Catholic background but and also the vice chair of the all party parliamentary group in Ireland and not all people from Scotland who are of my Irish background happen to be Catholic uh, and we are a broad church in the old sense, that broad kirk of diversity of opinion. Uh, and it's very similar to many of the issues that the Sikh community could be facing within Scotland. Um, and one of those is not just bigotry, but also endemic uh, specifically for the Sikh community. And, and I do hope that this community this report is an opportunity to build further racism uh, can undermine uh, a ethnic group's uh, relationship within the country it chooses to call home because in many ways there is no such thing as an ethnic scot it's an absolute myth uh, we are created up by many different diversities and inclusions whether you be from scotland from wales from the punjab uh, uh, from And no. I would leave you just merely with this thing that's ahead, um, briefly because of the impact of COVID-19. Martin, I'm ever so sorry. I, I think we are going to have to move on to someone else, but I can understand that you were about to make reference to the impact of COVID-19. Just to thank the community for all its uh, and um, I really appreciate the uh, the efforts that you've made to join us whilst you're on a train returning from London, Scotland. So uh, thank you so much for joining us, Martin. We really appreciate the support you've given to the Sikh community uh, and also for joining us this evening at the launch, at the Scottish launch of the British Sikh Report. Uh, I'm now going to pass on to Hardip, uh, Hardip Devsi who uh, is from the Social Security Directorate. But before I move on, I'm also going to say that we have a Q&A section at the bottom of the screens. I see that there are a couple of people who've raised their hands. What I'm going to suggest to anyone who wants to ask a question or anyone who's raised a hand, if you just put them in the Q&A section, that would be great because we can then come to that at the end of uh, today's event and we can just quickly go through the, the questions which are being raised. So please do share them there. Uh, Hardip, I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much uh, and thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, um, as you've said there, my name is Hardeep Singh Devsi. I'm the uh, Accessibility and Inclusion, Inclusion Lead in Social Security. Um, I'd like to commend uh, City Seeks for producing this British Seek report, Seek report, especially on the thorough research that goes into producing such a quality report. Um, as a Scottish Government civil service, I am quite envious of the report, especially the comprehensive analysis, which has obviously been founded on good quality data gathering processes and so on. Um, I think the categories of your analysis, such as identity, voting behaviour, employment, education, really do help to build a cohesive picture of the Sikh community. And I'm, I'm especially interested in the evidence that most Scottish Sikhs themselves identify as Scottish and not British. So I do wonder if EU referendum has influenced that view, or if, as your health warning chart might show, that the voting um, SNP might have influenced that view. But you know what, that can be a that could be a discussion for another time. Um, you're right. Uh, you know, in terms of the sample size from Scotland, it has been low. But what I'd like to see in future reports is a 
It's a comparative analysis um, of communities of similar size across perhaps um, the UK, perhaps broken down by socioeconomic status and by geographic regions. Um, I feel this would help to understand the nature of life in Scotland for, for Sikhs in comparison to Sikhs to other parts of the UK, especially if they are of a similar size or a, a similar socioeconomic group. And especially as because, you know, Scottish Sikhs only account for 2% of the entire Sikh population within the UK. Um, and, you know, as you've um, highlighted earlier, you know, the bulk of respondents were from London and the West Midlands. And this may, obviously, people may, um, you know, not saying they would, but they may discredit the report and say that it's been potentially skewed in terms of the statistics, not necessarily giving a balanced view of Sikhs across the UK. But, you know, albeit, the, you know, that people may make that criticism, I still feel that the report itself has huge value, especially as, you know, as a policymaker within the Scottish government. Um, I think, I think again, this, this report has excellent potential to, to be built upon and improved and reflect the experience of Scottish Sikhs. And as a civil servant, you know, I am keen that the report should influence policymakers in the heart of government. Um, so I hope I'm not coming across too negative. But, you know, in the spirit of, of SEVA, um, I'm more than happy to work with you to, both to increase the respondents of of, uh, of of this survey in Scotland, but probably more in, in tune with, with my work uh, to ensure that future SEEK reports, you know, gather comprehensive data within Scotland, especially that can be tied to um, the Scottish Government's national performance indicators. And then that way we can use the data coupled with the performance indicators, combine that with the requirements of the Sikh community so that we can really influence policy making within, within government in Scotland. Um, I think that would be a really um, aspirational end point. Um, and, and as I said, you know, I'm more than happy to, to work with you, uh, City Seeks, in producing future reports as well as any other organisations within Scotland, because it is really vitally important for Scottish Seeks to really have representation within that policy making environment. Um, thank you again, and I'll hand you back to the Chair. Uh, Hardy, thank you so much. And um, we're, we are more than happy with uh, positive feedback and uh, with constructive feedback, which is what you've provided. And I think you, you're absolutely right. There's always room for improvement. Um, we have changed a lot as a report over the last eight years or so that we've had the, the reports being published. Uh, back in 2013, if you have a look at some of the early reports, you will see that there was a a very different approach being taken, but we have always striven to improve as time has gone on. And we would more than welcome working with yourself and with others in Scotland in order to ensure that the Scottish Sikh community is properly represented and that we do have uh, a, a robust document which not only reflects the, uh, the information and that we have so far, but also from uh, across uh, Scotland. Uh, it has a more focus on so Scotland, I should say, because we do have the data um, one of the challenges we've had is the analysis and making sure that the analysis is done over the last few years um, in such a way that it rep um, represents and reflects the entirety of the UK. But we do have the data and I think it would be very uh, interesting to see how we can ensure that that data is put into uh, a report that shows a changing views over a period of time in Scotland as well. Jibdev, I don't know if you wanted to just make a, a couple of comments on that point. Yes, no, indeed. I mean, the main issue for us with uh, actually Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland has been the sample size that we do get le lower response than we would like. Uh, and that's what stops us from producing cystics specifically for those countries and also for English regions. Um, what you said about the possible skew to London and the Midlands, it's, it's not actually within the English regions, we have a fairly good representative sample. We've got a lot of responses from those regions because a lot of people live there. It is actually representative in that sense, uh, but uh, also from the rest of the country. It's just that from Scotland and Wales and Northern Ireland, we've got less than we should have proportionally. Um, and also, even if it was proportional, the sample numbers would be, uh, still be small. Uh, so we need to actually boost the sample to produce better breakdown. Because uh, even if we had a yeah, thousand sample cases, but to go down to parts of Scotland and so on, that would be difficult without uh, losing accuracy. So really, we, we need a sort of booster in, in Scotland. Um, I totally appreciate what you're saying. Uh, I mean, uh, we're looking at, we always ask for suggestions for questions and topics for 
next year. But our next year, probably we're going to look back on COVID as a key issue. People's experiences, whether it's uh, in their jobs, in their social life, mental health, and so on, all different aspects of life affected by COVID. But subsequently, though, I think we would like to move towards where now that we're getting information, so many different topics, how we could actually weight them together, like we have the deprivation indices in Scotland and the UK or other indices of well-being and so on, um, that we do have the potential to do that sort of thing now that we're collecting information on so many different topics. And um, that, that's my, my background is actually in national statistics and having worked on indices of deprivation and with colleagues in statistics uh, in Scotland as well, because uh, I was involved in regional and local and devolved uh, statistics across the UK. And that's very much what where I want to get to actually with this. Jigdev, thank you for that. And um, I'm not sure whether Jigdev gave a full introduction of himself when he spoke, but he is a former deputy director of the Office of, for National Statistics. He's a fellow of the Royal Statistical Society and he's a member of the UK National Statistics Advisory Group. So if there's anyone that we would be best uh, in the best hands of to ensure that we were being robust and reflective of uh, statistics throughout the UK, it would be him. So we're really grateful to have his support and, and hard work on this point. Uh, I'm now going to invite uh, Reverend Dr. Harriet Harris to say a few words. She is the uh, Edinburgh University Chaplain and the head of the Chaplaincy Service. Harriet. Thanks so much and it's a great honour to uh, be asked to speak to this report and, and to be with you all this evening. Um, so as a head of the University of Edinburgh, um, chaplaincy service. It's a multi-faith and belief chaplaincy and Trishna Singh has been our Sikh chaplain for many years now and we are immensely well supported by Trishna and delighted to be connected um, with the Sikh Sanjog and, and the work that they do. And Trishna's um, asked me to, to speak tonight about the Scottish context and perhaps um, I wonder also about um, the work of Sikh Sanjog. So one of the, the bits of work that um, Trishna brings to the university and works on with the University of Edinburgh is around um, encouraging young uh, Sikh women to carry on with their education and uh, not to feel um, any uh, a, a pressure to stop education at the age of 16 or, or not to continue into higher education. And I think that um, we know that, that, that um, Sikh communities in the UK are very committed to education, uh, both for, for females and males. Um, but uh, Trishna has really wanted to work with the university and, and we're delighted to, to be alongside her in this, in encouraging um, young Sikh um, girls from her community to have the um, opportunity and, and the choice um, and the, the sense of support to continue with their education. So that's one area of work um, that we're really pleased to be doing together um, in the Edinburgh context. Um, another area of work that uh, Trishna and um, uh, her, her community bring to the university is around um, cultural awareness and uh, We've, we've found it really important to be able to speak together um, about appreciation of diversity, um, of, of uh, art and culture that um, is brought um, by different communities, um, and also to be very honest about hate crime and uh, to, to promote and encourage reporting where that exists. And it was really interesting, the previous, a previous speaker um, talking about the turban, and I've just been recording a, a, a podcast with, for Islamophobia Awareness Month. Um, but one of the speakers in that podcast was saying how at school he was, um, the term turban Taliban was used um, against him and then how he felt about that and the context uh, was one in which his classmates were utterly shocked and how could the teacher have said that he himself laughed because he said on one level he thought it was funny and on, on another level he didn't know 
what to do about it and never reported it. And years later, it, it bothers him that he didn't report it. And now he, we, he, he's spoken about that. And we do, we run a campaign um, at the university, a no to, say no to hate campaign, um, where we encourage reporting and we also encourage the highlighting of these sorts of incidents, which may, which may on one level um, be received as, as kind of trivial by the person who's, who's sort of subject to that. And on another level goes extremely deep and stays with you for years and, and probably all of your life. So just a few of the comments I wanted to make about the absolute uh, value of, of our link with um, and our work uh, um, alongside Sikh members of the university and our, our Sikh chaplain. Uh, Harriet, thank you so much for sharing that with us and for also letting us know about the uh, the work that's being done to challenge hate in all of its forms at the university. I think it's important to remember that hate against one is hate against all. Um, I'm now going to invite Kiran Deep to say a few words. She is part of Sikhs and York. Kiran Deep. Thank you and good evening everyone. I um, just want to say warm welcome to everyone here tonight um, at the Scottish launch of the 2020 British um, Sikh report. Also thank you to City Sikhs for producing this report and highlighting key issues faced by Sikhs in the UK. Whilst we welcome the report at Sikhs and Job, we also recognise the very acute need for the report to address and represent the unique views and issues facing Sikhs living in Scotland today. By way of example, um, as highlighted in the introduction to the report, the COVID-19 pandemic has laid bare the stark inequalities which exist in our society. The pandemic has also highlighted the need for tailored approaches responding to the specific needs of the different four nations. And from the obvious disparities which exist between the approaches to the pandemic of the Scottish and Westminster government, it's quite clear that a UK approach must encompass all four corners of the United Kingdom. As outlined by Trishna Singh, the needs of Sikhs living in Scotland must be addressed through the collection of statistics and data relating to Sikhs living in Scotland. Sikhs and Jog are currently conducting a research project aimed at assessing the impact of COVID-19 on the Sikh community living in Scotland. This was done in response to the fact that no information had been gathered and continues not to be gathered by the Scottish Government on the impact of COVID-19 on Sikhs living in Scotland, despite the disproportionate nature in which those from ethnic minority backgrounds were and continues to be affected compared to their white counterparts. Our collective findings will be shared with both statutory and voluntary partners to help shape and develop future services to meet the needs of our community in Scotland. By way of another example um, in which we are gathering data um, within Scotland, this relates more specifically to Sikh women, um, is that Sikhs and Jog have also launched a Sikh Women Speak project in March 2020. And this is a nationwide project aimed at increasing the awareness of the main issues faced by Sikh women living in Scotland today. From this project, we'll be creating a very active recommendation report, which will be presented to government and other institutions to inform policy and other decision makers of the issues most affecting Sikh women in Scotland. Unfortunately, this has never been done before. Um, and once completed, our campaign will have been the biggest civic engagement of Sikh women in Scotland to have ever happened. As part of the project, Sikhs and Good Jog also hosted the first ever Sikh, a Scottish Sikh Women's Conference in March of this year, just before the pandemic, so we weren't breaking any uh, lockdown uh, laws. So as you can see here, the um, British Sikh report it does provide a very, very good insight into issues faced by the Sikh community in the UK. However, I believe, and I think it has been highlighted throughout this um, launch, 
in order for the report to be truly representative, it must encompass um, the research with all four nations of the UK. And we very much look forward to working with the British Geek Report in achieving this. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for that. And absolutely, this is one of the reasons why we're having the regional launches and the national launches. This is the first time that we have had launches take place outside of England. And part of this is to build up local resources, regional, national resources that we can tap into to ensure that we can get the, the samples for the respective countries and also make sure that we are reflecting the uh, views and opinions of those four, in, uh, four different nations uh, in the best way possible within the British Sea Report. So, Kieran Duke, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm now going to ask uh, Dilraj Saki to say a few words. Dilraj is also from uh, Six and Jog. Dilraj. Uh, thank you, sir. Just for you. I am a member of Sikhs and Jog, uh, but I'm actually uh, the CEO of a Muslim women's organization, and I also uh, am an environmental practitioner. So there'll be a certain bias, in, uh, and I do apologize for the noise in the background. Uh, there'll be a certain uh, bias in how I would reflect on this report, and I'm just going to make that explicit right up front. Uh, I really... I'm very grateful for the opportunity today. Thank you very much for inviting me to the panel and uh, a very well done and congratulations to the British Seek Report uh, team to have produced such a robust uh, piece of work. Uh, my reflections are based as a woman. So as a practitioner who's a woman and has a fairly kind of gendered uh, focus uh, in the work she does. And uh, my kind of... Uh, you know, the, the advantage of speaking last is uh, you get to listen to amazing kind of reflections, but also uh, there's a challenge of not repeating yourself what other speakers have said. So I was going to reflect a bit on the hate crime stats, uh, which the report highlighted. And what was really concerning for me was uh, the fact that the younger generation felt a lot more vulnerable um, uh, to quote the exact stats. I think it was the age was very worried and your categories across your categories, the younger people felt a lot more Worried about the impact of hate crime. And uh, as you may know, uh, we've got the hate crime bill passing through the parliament currently. Uh, that is an issue which is very close at heart for a lot of women like myself uh, who are working in the community and living in the community. Uh, what would be useful going forward is to perhaps tease out the gendered impact of people's experiences. And what this report does is it lays out a very good roadmap for us to do that. Uh, the next step I would, uh, how I would like to see is if we can see the stories evolving from those because it's not just the quantitative data, it's also the qualitative data, the case studies which really help push for policy agendas. Uh, another area which I thought was very interesting was the employment edu and education section. Uh, you speak about, uh, well, the report speaks about more women likely to be in part-time roles, uh, roughly about 15%. And uh, the kind of sectors they work uh, are usually healthcare, teaching, and education. Now, in our experience, what we tend to see is women are usually occupationally segregated. So they are going for lower paid jobs, not because they're wanting to do them, because that's what they have access to. And uh, the second thing we've seen is women, because of their part time. Uh, because of the caring responsibilities or other responsibilities in the life are kind of forced into making a choice for part-time roles. And in a policy context, it would be very useful to get more insights as to how those choices are being made or why those choices are being made or what are the opportunities out there which are kind of forcing women to make those choices. And this is just one example. Uh, I'll tie this back to an EHRC report, which is produced in 2008. So that's how far, that's how um, old the data is. We don't have any more data since I did a quick search online uh, where they were talking about pay gaps uh, across equality areas. And what they observed was women of all religious denominations and those with none had pay gaps relative to Christian women. And these were the highest, hold a breath, for Sikh, and Muslim women. So what would be really kind of useful, um, you know, uh, something which one of your earlier speakers mentioned, um, Hardeep, uh, he mentioned about getting the specifics out of these uh, 
um, kind of key themes you run, uh, you know, you're running the report would be really useful for us to then advocate and ask for real change on the ground. And I completely agree with what Hardeep recommended that we use the national performance framework. But in addition to that, I would also, because then there's this whole challenge of your devolved nations priorities. I think it, to kind of subvert that you could look at doing the SDGs or the wider UK frameworks to set out the themes that uh, you know, would inform some of the analysis. And um, last but not the least, um, this uh, we, we are you know, on, the, on the topic of COVID. What uh, I have seen in my experience and my engagement with communities and women, uh, both BME and Sikh women, is we've been disproportionately impacted due to the burden of care, due to the, uh, the, the sectors which have been uh, affected by COVID and due to, um, you know, women staying at home and men staying more at home, which means we've seen a rise in incidents of domestic violence. And I think these are real key issues which really need to be dealt with. Uh, they speak back to your national performance framework. They speak back to our priorities as a nation, uh, as a devolved nation. I think those issues would be, you know, we would welcome more insights on those. And I'm happy to work um, and contribute my uh, my time and resource uh, in whatever capacity to develop that thinking further. But yeah, I would, I would kind of uh, sign off on that note saying, well done, it's really good piece of work. And I'm looking forward to the next iteration given COVID uh, and you know how much that's thrown up uh, in our faces. So yeah, thank you so much. Dear Raj, thank you for that. And uh, thank you for the offer of helping. We're always looking for volunteers. We're always looking for uh, individuals who have the capabilities and the capacity to do the analysis with us to ensure that this is going out into the communities, that we are getting the level of responses that we need. So the more help and support we can get, the better. If anyone who is uh, attending this evening does want to help, then you can email us at info at britishseatreport.org. That's info at britishseatreport.org. Please let us know how you'd wish to get involved and we can then see how best to um, get your assistance, work with you to ensure that this goes out as far and as wide as possible when it comes to the questionnaire, when it comes to the survey we have each year, and then also making sure that the analysis of the data is done accurately. Uh, I'm now going to just invite um, Jigbev uh, to uh, take part in the Q&A session. Um, we have uh, a couple of questions which have been asked, uh, and I'm not sure whether Jigbev would uh, want to answer those. So Jigbev? I just need to unmute you first. Right, there's one from Raman Deep Kaur. How was the survey for the report circulated in Scotland versus England, Wales and Northern Ireland to encourage engagement? And we do try to find every means possible to send the survey everywhere we can. And uh, I spent some time looking actually at for uh, websites and Facebook pages for Gurdwaras to send to them directly to other organizations, to Six and Jog, I think we also sent it, trying to sort of get as wide a circulation as possible of the survey. Uh, but we do need a lot more help with that to increase the sample size uh, for the survey. Um, so I mean, that was partly the reason for I actually visited while I was actually up there for a conference last year in Glasgow. And I did actually then go around to various good bars as well, just to raise the profile, give them copies of the report as well. Um, but yes, as, as we sort of keep saying, we need help in there's two areas. One is suggestions for topics and questions. I think a lot of those issues have come up today, how to sort of formulate the next report, particularly how we can uh, do that to suit purposes uh, or use for Scotland. And secondly, how we get more responses uh, from people living in Scotland. So, so it, it's a, we need to work together. I think we need as much help as possible from all of you. Uh, to spread the word, to raise the awareness when, when the survey goes out. Um, regarding whether the BSL makes recommendations to government or other organisations, I think I, for me, I see my role as a statistician, as we, I did when I was in Office for National Statistics, is to provide the statistics to inform the debate. And it's then for politicians, policymakers, people like Hardip and, and others to use the statistics and to tell us as users of statistics what more you want. Um, yeah, so I think that's again is a two-way process, but I wouldn't want to be involved in the policy process. It's more informing the policy debate with sound, robust statistics that are useful to the users of statistics. And that maintains independence as well, that the, the statistics are not biased because of 
who wants them. You know, they're not answering a question the way that you want it answered. I want to produce independent statistics that are there for all to use. Big there, thank you so much. Uh, I just want to thank everyone for attending this evening. It's been wonderful hearing for so many wonderful speakers. Uh, so I want to thank each of them. I want to thank uh, Jigdev Singh Birdi, Trishna Singh, Dr. Maureen Sia, uh, Martin Doherty MP, Hardip Devsi, Reverend Dr. Harriet Harris, uh, Kirandeep Gaur and Dilraj Sokhi. Such wonderful contributions. And it's been very inspiring to see the work that's being done in Scotland but also the desire that there is and the appetite for there to be greater involvement from Scottish Sikhs to ensure that the British Sikh report is more reflective of Scotland. So that's wonderful to hear. Uh, thank you also to the British Sikh report team and to all of the volunteers who have put in so much hard work and effort to make sure that the report was produced. I also want to thank all of the supporting partners who are behind the British Sikh report this year, namely NHS, Blood and Transplant, uh, City Sikhs, and the Sikh Assembly. Uh, and I also want to finally thank everyone for attending this evening, for your questions, for making sure that this event has gone as smoothly as it has. Thank you, everyone. Uh, have a lovely evening, and we look forward to working with you very closely in the near future. Take Can I just care. say an extra thank special you. thank you to Dr. Maureen Sear for all the uh, transcription of the... <laughs> It's been wonderful. Thank you. It's been great to see that summary in the corner. So thank you so much. Dr. Oh, I Maureen. thought I was only sending it to Manji. I didn't realise that everyone else could see it anyway. Hey I think we've all appreciated it. So thanks for being our official transcriber for the day. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Take care. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.